I'm Kara Morgan. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Coffee with Kara, sponsored by The Human Bean in Newport and Lincoln City. And I'm excited to be on this Zoom meeting with Nikenge Harmon Johnson, who is the president of Urban League Portland. Thank you so much for taking time from what I know must be an incredibly busy schedule <laughs> to come and sit with us so we can learn more about you and your incredible organization. I'm um, really delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, Nikenge, please tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. I sure will. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Nikenge Harmon Johnson. Uh, I am the chief executive of the Urban League of Portland. Uh, this has been my job for a little over eight years now. And uh, it's one of, uh, I've had a career of, of, of doing things that I like to do. Um, I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, and still the Urban League of Portland has managed to be my very favorite job. My toughest job, but my very favorite one. Um, oh, before we, I really get started, I'll tell you, uh, this morning I'm drinking uh, a coffee with um, a little ginger tea mixed in. Ooh. Never tried it before, but uh, because of your, uh, your your sponsor, I thought this would, might be a nice little mix. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, we appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your background and what you do. Sure. Uh, I'm an Oregon girl. I grew up in Portland and in Salem. Um, you know, I'm fortunate to be the daughter of uh, a teacher. My mom taught at Chinookka Community College for most of my life. She was one of the first faculty members there, which meant I got to grow up on campus. Um, all of the libraries and all the fields and all the teams and all the big kids. And, uh, and I could probably teach sociology or uh, women and, and families uh, 101 with my eyes closed. I've sat through so many of my mom's classes. It was really a great way to grow up. Uh, me and my big brother uh, and my father um, was a corrections officer. Um, when I was a kid. Um, and then he said, uh, you know, if I had met some of these guys who were locked up in the penitentiary, if I'd met them 10, 15 years earlier, they might not be locked up. And so when I went to college, my father went to grad school and he became a mental health therapist. So uh, there you go. Um, I'm fortunate to have a family um, that taught me um, what, what justice looks like. And it's not just uh, in the courtroom, although I am a lawyer and certainly it takes place there, but it's also absolutely out in the community um, person to person. So that's a little bit about me and my family. Uh, let's see, my husband and I, we got a couple of dogs. We're shepherd people. Um, so a Belgian Malinois, um, also known as a Belgian shepherd and a German shepherd. Um, and we tend to have a bunch of chickens. Uh, we're pullet people. So we tend to raise chickens and turkeys we're a little light on chickens right now, which is crazy because eggs cost a fortune, <laughs> um, uh, but we enjoy it uh, for our family. And I live in the, I live in the Mid Valley. Um, I live in Salem, although most of our Urban League offices are in the Portland metro area. Um, our team lives um, all over the place because we serve all of Oregon and Southwest Washington. So um, presently, um, I happen to be uh, back in Salem. Wonderful. And tell us a little bit about Urban League of Portland and what you guys do. Love to. Uh, the Urban League of Portland is one of the oldest social justice and civil rights organizations in the Pacific Northwest. I'm going to say that again because it's kind of a mouthful, but it's really important for, um, for your it listeners is. to know. The Urban League of Portland is one of the oldest social justice and civil rights organization in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we are 78 years old. Um, I want folks to take a minute to think about what was going on in Oregon uh, and in the world 78 years ago. <laughs> um, that will really put into context what this organization is. Um, in terms of what was happening in our economy, what was happening with housing issues, um, what was happening related to race um, and justice in America. Um, and uh, what's really great about this role in our organization for me is that our headquarters is located two blocks away from my middle school. Um, we are absolutely a community-based organization. Um, we're unusual as urban leagues go. There are nearly 90 urban leagues across the country. Um, but our Urban League serves a region rather than just a county or a city. We serve all of Oregon and Southwest Washington, and we have um, for years. Right now, we're in the midst of stepping that up even further so that we have our advocacy on a local level um, and that we also are offering programmatic uh, services um, across the state, whether that's in housing um, or relates to youth and education or workforce and jobs for grownups uh, or services to senior citizens and disabled adults. Uh, we do all of that uh, and more at the Urban League of Portland. That's incredible. And to have such a rich history 
Can you talk a little bit about how the program has grown over those years? Oh, goodness. It's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> uh, you know, when I was a kid, um, I did Saturday school at the Urban League. Uh, the first time I, I volunteered for Meals on Wheels uh, to serve our seniors was through the Urban League. Uh, Kwanzaa celebrations in the wintertime. Just the Urban League was a was a thread in my life. Uh, and when I was applying for this job, I realized it. because They asked you, what's your connection to the Urban League? And I thought, well, I never worked here before. Did I never really volunteer to the Urban League before? Well, I guess I don't have a connection. You know, we're members. That's Is that a thing? My parents were paying the membership, you know. Um, and then I thought, wait a minute. That's not true. I've been an Urban Leaguer for a long time. Uh, and that's what the Urban League means to community, is that we're just a part of the community. Um, certainly, we step in to do big things when necessary, including uh, the Organ Cares Fund. It's a, a $62 million fund that the Urban League was um, integral uh, in starting during the pandemic um, to help people survive, to help businesses make it through, to help nonprofits make it through, to help families and individuals make it through. Uh, that was work that we could do because of the scale of our organization. While we are community-based, um, well, let's put it this way. We have grown in size tenfold uh, since I became the president about eight years ago. So I'm a staff of about 20 to, oh, 140 um, is where we stand right now. And I'm really proud of that number, um, but more so because it means that we help thousands more people a year than we once were able to. Now people can reach out to us and we can respond with, hey, we're going to get on that for you, as opposed to, oh, we wish we could help, but we don't have the capacity. Yeah, it's sending um, somebody somewhere else and it, it just becomes a frustrating maze. Uh, that's right. Do you work with youth? We do. We're actually in the midst of our summer camp right now. So uh, in... Um, and near our headquarters, actually at my old middle school, Harriet Tubman Middle School, um, is where we're hosted this summer. <laughs> uh, we've got I know our that. kiddos. <laughs> <laughs> Love this school. Um, but we've got our kiddos in summer camp right now. So let's see, today's Thursday. Uh, on Tuesdays, uh, the youth were hosting their community food bank. Um, every year since the beginning of the pandemic, our youth said, I want to help. I want to help. What can I do? I know that there's struggles in my community. What can I do? And we challenged them to ask, you know, well, what can you do? What do you want to do to be a part of the solution? Um, our youth programs are very much based upon how we can be the hands for the youth, but they get to be the head and the heart. How can we as adults um, and as an organization facilitate what they want to do? Because they know everything they need to know. Um, they're just not old enough for us to let them do it by themselves. <laughs> right. And I'm sure of that because I remember being a kid. I remember. <laughs> um, and I feel, I feel pretty much the same way about justice now as I did then. Uh, so we want them to have that leadership role. And food was really key for them. They said, listen, we want to do a food bank. So during COVID, it was our youth who said, we said, you know, we got to keep you safe. They were in the parking lot at the Urban League stuffing boxes and bags with turkey and cheese and milk and eggs and other products. And they were in the parking lot organizing the drive up, you know, food pickup and put it in people's trunks and check them off the list. And, you know, um, and they were the ones who said, let's put something in the bags for kids, whether it's a puzzle or it's, you know, uh, it's coloring, it's something else that we can offer. Um, so that everyone in that house not only has some nutrition, but also, you know, something a little more fun. Um, that was led by our kiddos. Well, now in summer camp, they still are doing a food bank. So that happened on Tuesday. Uh, on Wednesday, they were learning about financial empowerment, financial capabilities. I know a lot of Oregonians, we lament that our kids don't know how to, they don't know what a check is, first of all, but they don't right. have to balance a checkbook. <laughs> and then as adults, we don't know how to make a budget or to prepare to buy a, a car or a house or just, you know, you learn the lessons the hard way. Um, and we talk about how we should teach, you know, uh, young people earlier. Well, that's what we're doing at the Urban League of Portland through our financial empowerment collaborative. We're teaching them um, this little skill they'll need, um, you know, as they begin to, uh, to come into their own. That's phenomenal. Yeah, back back in my day, I'm old. <laughs> Aren't we all now? <laughs> we had economics and we had, you know, life skills that were taught, you know, sewing, cooking, you know, things like that, that were um, necessary for, you know, survival on your own and being right. an adult. And um, now it's so difficult for kiddos to have that and then they get out into this world and they're really um unless they have really strong parents that you know are able to give them those skills um uh, mm -hmm. they're they're lacking so i think it's incredible that you guys are are doing that thank you for what you do thank and, you so much i appreciate that 
an important event coming up um, here on the coast in Lincoln City that I'm yeah. very excited about. Let's talk about what you're doing. Let's do it. So uh, on August 8th, uh, the Urban League of Portland, along with some of our local partners and friends, are going to be hosting a conversation about housing and homelessness um, as it relates to, uh, to mental health and uh, mental illness, um, both in Lincoln County and also more, more broadly, because Lincoln County is a great example of what housing and homelessness and mental health issues are like across the rest of our state. Um, so on August 8th, we're having a community conversation. We're inviting folks to come out and join us. We'll be at the casino, uh, really talking about these issues, asking experts um, for some of their opinions and ideas about where we need to be focusing our time and our resources to make sure that we can get folks living inside on the coast. Um, and the conversation isn't always centered in our bigger um, urban areas because we know the the the, the issue and the challenges um, are as greater greater um, in our rural communities too. So that's what we'll be doing on August eighth uh, in the evening. We're also hosting a reception. I think our reception starts at five thirty, um, and at, at Chinook Winds will be at the Chinook Winds uh, Resort Hotel. And we'd like folks to come out. We want to you know meet and greet and shake your hand and say hello. And then the conversation itself is going to start uh, at six o'clock, so from six to seven thirty. And you'll have a chance to participate. The audience can uh, ask questions and all of that. What do you hope to gain from the conversation? What do you hope happens? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you why we do it, and uh, that will answer part of that question. Uh, the Urban League of Portland is our name. Uh, Cause I don't have the guts to change it. <laughs> Frankly, it's been our name for 78 years and should smart be people chose Should be Urban League of Oregon? Is that <laughs> I mean, it should be the Urban League of Oregon in Southwest Washington, you know, technically. Um, it doesn't roll off the tongue the same way that Urban League of Portland does, I suppose, you know. Um, but in any case, it's important that our communities know that we belong to them. Uh, you know, my family, um, you know, lives actually in Lincoln City uh, or just outside Lincoln City and plays in Lincoln City. Um, it's always been an important uh, part of my life. But we've done these conversations um, in Hood River and in Ashland and in Salem um, as an important way to let community know that the Urban League belongs to you and we're responsible for your community, um, even if you don't see us every day and don't let the, the Portland um, part of our name, you know, scare you away. It's just because I'm a chicken. <laughs> Uh, no, and you also have chickens. <laughs> you have chickens. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Not enough, right? But I do. Uh, it's that you know, because of COVID, especially. This is true for all of us. We haven't been able to be with one another um, the ways that we would like to be. Just some of the regular activities, whether it's the state fair or something else that tends to bring people together, um, we couldn't do those sorts of things. And so people haven't seen the Urban League um, in their neighborhoods lately. Um, and they've seen us on, on screen, which is wonderful. We invite people to sh uh, follow us on social, to visit our website at ulpdx.org. You can find out about our various activities. And we're still trying to stream things when we can because it does create that additional access. All of our voter uh, forums that we did, we did more than two dozen last year. I mean, just cranked them out. And that wasn't just on um, Portland races or Marion County races. We really did spread it out um, so that we could engage more folks. But there's nothing like being together in person. There's nothing like being able to shake hands and see each other face to face. Um, and and really there's just talk something about, about that energy being in a room, right? That's right. That's right. So that's one of the things we're hoping to get is just that, that, that connectivity um, that we've been missing out. That's uh, to remind folks that we belong to them and we're responsible for them um, wherever they are. Uh, and really to continue to center the importance of discussing mental health uh, and housing and housing resources and really what some of the solutions are so that we can learn from each other. And the people who are really already doing the work in Lincoln um, will be there to be able to talk about it uh, themselves firsthand. And who are some of those folks who will be on hand for this community discussion? Ooh, ooh, let me get my list. Okay. <laughs> Um, I will be there, of course. Um, but we will also be joined by Claire Hall, a Lincoln County Commissioner. Pretty excited mm -hmm. about that. We had a great conversation with Claire the other day, um, just to, as we were continuing to plan this event. Um, and one of my friends and colleagues, uh, Sheila Stiley, she'll be there. She's the Executive Director of Northwest Coastal Housing. Um, she's also the, uh, the Chairwoman of Oregon Housing. It's an advocacy group made up of affordable housing mm -hmm. um, developers and operators like the Urban League and others. Um, so she's got both a local perspective, but also a statewide perspective that she can bring to the table. I'm really excited about that. Um, and special guest, uh, Director Andrea Bell is going to join us from Tina Kotex Administration. Um, she's the Oregon 
Housing and Community Services Director. Um, in Oregon, that's the equivalent of our Housing and Urban Development Department. Uh, they're the folks that help decide where the funds are going to go. They help set strategy um, across the state, whether it's to respond to houselessness caused by wildfires um, or something else. Uh, Doctor or, or Director Bell is uh, she's she's on point for that. So we're excited to have her here for the conversation. And of course, there's hope that it'll go beyond conversation. Um, the conversation is where it starts, but is there hope to have some action after? Yes, uh, that's the great thing about having folks like Sheila um, on the panel. Um, she's she she's one of the folks that actually does the walks the talk. <laughs> um, uh, and I'm proud to say that the Urban League is too. Uh, eight years ago when I started, the Urban League didn't have a robust housing program. We could refer you to resources, but that was about it. Um, today, um, we're an organization that's one of the biggest housing service providers in the state. Um, we are self-taught in many ways because I got sick of hearing people complain about it and not in the ring <laughs> doing something about it. How do you what, how do you deal with homelessness? You offer housing <laughs> um, that people can't afford, um, and you support those who couldn't otherwise enter housing themselves. And frankly, you build more housing. Maybe there are other ways and there are other things folks should do. And I hope we'll hear some of those discussions um, when you join us on August 8th. But that's what made sense to me. So I'll do my part. <laughs> um, and amazing how it works. Now we have helped um, thousands of people um, come move in from outside, from senior citizens um, to others. So certainly, yes, um, it starts with conversation in many ways. And this is a conversation that's being held, but we're hoping to um, to level it up a little bit and also to sh show folks what can be done when we work together work being the key issue. Mm -hmm. We can talk, but then we actually have to make it happen. Um, and the Urban League is a great example of just saying, all right, well, I think we can help. Let's get in there. Um, and we built a affordable housing building during the pandemic. That's um, amazing. You know, it's our first during, during my tenure, certainly, but now there are, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens um, of elders and other folks who were living in their cars and living outside uh, just months ago, well, they moved into their apartments in April and May um, in North Portland. That's That kind of success can happen all over the place and is happening um, to some extent on the coast, but we need even more of it. So we're hoping that some of the action is that by shining a light on the good work that's being done, that we can um, you know, help draw even more resources to, to, to support it. That would be incredible and much needed, um, especially as you mentioned around mental health. A lot of the folks that we have, um, I've worked with programs um, helping out uh, those who are unhoused. And uh, a lot of those who have mental illness or those who are on disability have such limited financial resources that it makes it incredibly difficult. And after you've been on the street or camping or in your car, and you've gotten to know that world for so long, it really takes some challenges to move from that safety net into something else and feel secure that it's not going to disappear after you get in there and you're going to be back in that situation again. Absolutely right. Uh, that's one of the reasons that the Urban League, so you know, we're like seven nonprofits in one. Um, we offer uh, services for youth and we offer workforce services. We offer such so as job training and other things. We have our senior citizens program. We visit elders at home, but we also offer a uh, senior citizens activity center. So they can come and, um, and you know, get nutrition, but also learn, you know, practice Tai Chi or play music or dance or go on outings, but just stay active um, and safe in our community. Um, we offer our advocacy services and we offer our housing uh, services as well. There's lots of different things going on at the Urban League. We are like seven nonprofits in one. Um, that's challenging, uh, uh, of course, um, it makes us very unusual, um, but the best part about it is that we can offer wraparound services. So we've got community health workers who can engage with folks who um, are, we're trying to get into housing. We have outreach workers who can meet folks in those tents and, um, and living in their cars and get them resources right now to help them stay safe and stay alive and work with them toward getting into housing. At the same time, people who are the working poor, we got people who, who have jobs, who get paychecks, who live in their trunks. Um, you know, those folks, do they need more skills? Do they need some other kind of support? Do they need health insurance? We can wrap around them um, and help them um, from where they are um, move to where they want to be. So it, it's 
because there are so many challenges that folks face for us, it's really important to be able to address those challenges um, in-house to the extent possible, rather than saying, well, we can only do this one little piece. We right. offer a variety of services that help people get unstuck. Um, and it makes all the difference in the world. It does. And I think you you hit the nail on the head um, that that's what's really important is having all those services available. A lot of times people get the wrong impression that, oh, we'll just build them a shelter and then they can just stay there and problem solved. It's not problem solved. These are human beings that we're talking about that have their issues and need possibly more additional help and support. And I've seen success stories of people who have been able to get some of those services and have been able to lift themselves up and are, you know, contributing parts of society and end up giving back by volunteering and, you know, completing the cycle and helping out in, in other areas in the community. And um, I feel that that's what it's really all about. Absolutely. I agree with you. I mean, think about it. If well, I hate to say it this way, but uh, if I lived on the streets, how long would it take me to start to feel like I was losing my mind? Mm -hmm. How afraid would I be? How, you know, at risk would I be? How, what, even if you, you are well, um, when you begin living on the streets, your mental health deteriorates very rapidly. So these things are, they're intertwined uh, quite closely. Um, and living inside of doors hides a multitude of sins. I kind of think about it that way. You know, um, but also it begins to allow people to really stabilize those folks who have been traumatized and who have been living outside. Um, now they can, you know, whether it's medicine, now you can take your medicine on a regular basis. Now you can keep your, your health appointments on a regular basis because you're, you got a, you've got a standard address. Now you've got health insurance. Now you can eat well. Now you can sleep well. We all know, um, you know, the impact of not getting sleep, what that does to our brains. And and I am not an expert in these areas, but it just seems pretty common sense to me. You you know, you move, you or I who seem like reasonable individuals outside for, you know, even a short amount of time. And our brain chemistry is going to, to change to respond to that environment. And you can't just sort of throw the keys back at us and say, well, you live inside now and think that suddenly all of that has become, become you know, uh, unwind. It just doesn't make sense. 100%. We've seen it um, more often than I, 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 I hate to say it, but it, it is something that we see quite frequently is that um, people, like you said, that are on the streets, um, they're not able to sleep as well. And sleep, people may not realize, but, but get, you know, six to eight hours of sleep every night. Um, when you're getting one or two, it does not take long for your mental health to deteriorate and that can affect your job it can affect your children um, it affects everything and it just creates that spiral so i'm super happy to hear um, that you know this conversation is happening um, let's let folks know how they can get involved and how they can sign up for this incredible conversation on the 8th Will do. Uh, there are a number of things folks can do. Um, we invite you to, uh, to visit us on our website. It's ulpdx.org. That's ulpdx.org. Uh, and you can register there. Um, let us know you're coming. We look forward to expecting you. Um, we'll also be streaming this conversation. So if you're unable to, to join us in person, you can get information um, when you register about how you can log on and see it there. Um, and all of our events can be found at ulpdx.org uh, uh, slash events. Um, if you've got questions about uh, the event, feel free to um, email us at the Urban League, um, ACE, that's A-C-E, at ulpdx.org, ACE, at ulpdx.org. You can also reach us on social media. We're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook. Uh, and I think, I think we're going to be asking folks to submit questions via social media as well. So if you're not live in the audience, that's all right. You'll still have a, um, an opportunity to submit your question um, for this panel discussion um, with Commissioner Hall, Executive Director, um, Executive Director uh, Sheila, um, and uh, Andrea Bell, and me on August 8th at Chinook Winds. Fabulous. And I know the panel well. I've worked with them across many different avenues through the years, and uh, they are an incredible resource. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for joining us today. Is there anything else you want to add real quick as we're wrapping up? Um, I just want to say that I'm excited for um, the Urban League to be doing this event in person um, in Lincoln County. We've also got another one of our supporters, Naya, 
um, is one of the co-hosts for this event. So we're delighted to be working with community to highlight community um, in person uh, um, in Lincoln. So uh, thanks a lot. And thanks for having me. I really appreciate you. Wonderful. Well, I look forward to meeting you in person at the event. And thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Coffee with Kara. We are sponsored by The Human Being in Newport at 6th Street and Highway 101. And when you come to Lincoln City, you can find them at the north end of town on the west side of the highway next to TLC Credit Union. For Oregon Coast Breaking News, I'm Kira Morgan.